People have said it's so inexplicable that maybe we can understand it as following. Turns out if it was much bigger than it is, no galaxies would form. So let's say there are not one universe, but many different universes. And the energy of empty space can vary in each one, and then it only in those when it's, in which it's not much greater than what we measure today will galaxies form. And only then will stars and planets form, and only then will astronomers form. So the universe is the way it is because there are astronomers here to measure. <laughs> it sounds ridiculous. It sounds like a tautology, or it sounds religious almost. It's neither. It's kind of cosmic natural selection. You know, Darwin told us that the, the diversity of life on Earth wasn't designed. Bees can see the color of flowers, not because they were designed to do it, but if they couldn't, they wouldn't find the nectar that would allow them to reproduce. Well, we would not expect to find ourselves in a universe in which we couldn't live. We'd be quite surprised. <laughs> so if this is true, it's not that surprising. It just says there are many universes. We find ourselves living in a universe in which there are galaxies, and galaxies can allow stars and planets, etc. It's a depressing thought because it means at some fundamental level, this fundamental quantity, the energy of empty space, is an accident. But particle physicists are way ahead of cosmologists. Because, you know, cosmologists don't understand one number, the energy of empty space, but particle physicists haven't understood many more numbers for much longer. <laughs> we don't understand why gravity is the weakest force in nature. We don't understand why the proton is 2,000 times heavier than the electron. We don't understand why there are three generations of elementary particles. And so particle physicists have jumped on this and said, maybe we don't have to understand anything. Maybe it's all an accident. Maybe if any of these things were different, life wouldn't have arisen. And in every universe, these numbers are different. And then we don't need a theory of everything, we just need a theory of anything. And, and we, well, we have a candidate theory, it's called string theory, so I want to give you one slide on string theory. <laughs> Those who've never heard of it. One guy says to the other, I, I just had an awesome idea. Suppose that all matter and energy is made of tiny vibrating strings. The second person says, okay, what would that imply? The first person says, I don't know. <laughs> that, that's the history of string theory over the last four years. <laughs> but it's an interesting theory, but one of the problems with this theory is it predicted that there are lots of extra dimensions in the universe, maybe six or seven extra dimensions, and where you don't see them, so where it happens to them? Well, maybe they're, they're compactified in such a small distances that we can't measure them. But every different turns out every different way you compactify these extra dimensions produces a different four-dimensional universe. And that was a warp. That was an ugly point about string theory. It didn't predict a unique four-dimensional universe like the one we live in. But now, like every warp of string theory, it's become a beauty mark. Because now it's a landscape for that possible anthropic idea. Maybe every one of those universes has different laws of physics. And when a universe pops into existence, the laws that are associated with that universe pop into existence with it. In which case, no matter, no radiation, no space, no time, no laws. That's nothing, to me, anyway. Now, I should point out from a philosophical perspective that this is an interesting question in some sense, because many people have, were driven and, to the idea of a prime mover, a first cause in the language of the Roman Catholic Church, because how could you create a universe if you weren't outside of our universe? That's why you needed some eternal being who was outside our universe. And, 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 and as primitive peoples believed in intentionality, they created a god to do it. I want to point out that this idea that our universe may not be unique, and there may be many universes, they call a multiverse. There may be universes elsewhere popping into existence today. And from a philosophical perspective, that multiverse is outside of our universe. It could be eternal. And therefore, for people who like the idea of that kind of thing, the multiverse can play the role of God, or a prime mover. Now, I want to point out, that's just talk, first of all. Secondly, we weren't driven to this to replace God. We, we weren't driven to this multiverse because we didn't like God. I don't like God. But we were driven to it by the data. That's the important point. It wasn't some philosophical discussion of how would we like the universe to originate. The data has suggested to us, from particle physics and cosmology, that maybe our universe isn't unique. And maybe there is a multiverse. And certainly, 
our universe has the properties it does because it could come from nothing. And that's the important thing. We've been driven to it by nature. We haven't assumed we know the answer before we ask the question. Now, in deference, to, I want to close in deference to my late friend Christopher Hitchens, a wonderful man who was writing the foreword for this particular book before he died. And I used to explain physics to Christopher, and he pointed out to me when I was explaining in the future that nothing is heading towards us as fast as can be. And I want to just quickly tell you what that means. Because if we ask what the future will be like, it's rather interesting. I remember I told you 85 years ago the universe consisted of one galaxy and it was static and eternal. In the far future, two trillion years from now, observers who live on planets or on stars, and there will be stars two trillion years from now, and, and organic materials and planets and beings that can evolve around them. Right? And anyway, I like to say, use the word evolve. <laughs> and what will they do? They'll develop the laws of quantum mechanics, they'll discover electromagnetism, they'll discover gravity, and etc. They'll build telescopes. What will they see? Nothing. Because the universe is speeding up now, and all the galaxies that we now see will well, then be moving away from us faster than the speed of light, which is allowed in general relativity. They will have disappeared. All evidence of the Big Bang will have disappeared. And observers who look out will see a single galaxy which are located, surrounded by a vast, dark, empty, eternal space. And they will return, poetically, to the picture of the universe that we incorrectly had a hundred years ago. But eventually, even these stars will burn out. And we'll end up with a cold, dark, empty universe. And so, in, as Christopher put it, the answer to the question, why is there something rather than nothing, is really quite simple. Just wait, there won't be for long. <laughs> <laughs> and that's an important answer, because it, it reinforces our cosmic conceit. We assume we're the pinnacle of evolution, and nothing's ever going to change. Of course it's changing. We assume that we're the pinnacle of the universe, that it's the way it is, and it's always going to be that way. It isn't. We're here in a brief cosmic moment, and in the far future it will be quite different. We are fortunate to live right now. In fact, that's the second lesson I wanted to give you. First one, you remember it? You're insignificant. Remember that. <laughs> <laughs> second, the future is miserable. <laughs> Those are the two things you need to remember from this lecture. So, to conclude, science has demonstrated that a universe of nothing is not only plausible, but actually likely. What we mean by something and nothing has completely changed. That's the issue I want to point out. Science has changed the meaning of those words. There's nothing wrong. It's not a, it's not a scam. We change the meaning of the words just like we change the meaning of the question about planets. As we learn about nature by probing it, the meaning of things changed. And so the question means a very different thing than it did when theologians and philosophers first raised it. And to repeat, the why question is not the interesting question. The how questions are the interesting questions. How did the universe evolve, and how can we find out? And that's what we are continuing to do. So, I don't want you to be depressed by the fact that you're insignificant. You're insignificant. <laughs> I don't want you to be depressed by the fact that the future is miserable. I want you to be happy. Because in fact, there is no evidence of purpose in the universe, but the means of purpose is what we make of it. We are fortunate enough to have evolved the consciousness and, 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 and at a time when we can ask these very questions. And we can look back to the earliest moments of the history of the universe. We can see those 100 billion galaxies. So instead of being depressed about the fact that we are just a miserable accident in a universe without purpose, we should instead enjoy our brief moment in the sun. Thank you very much.